Okay, welcome everyone to this um, afternoon's, well, afternoon for us, morning for some discussion on the theme, what is theoretical biology? There are going to be four panelists. You see their names listed on the screen, Aprati Mazumdar, Pauline Hochweg, Sri Ram Ramaswamy, and Francesca Mallam. Uh, the format... Vidya, can you make it full screen? Make your pardon? Can you make it full screen? Full screen, okay, sorry, 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 sorry. Is that better? Yeah, perfect. So the format is going to be that each of them speaks for 10 minutes to tell us how they see this question. And after the first round, each of them speaks for 10 minutes once again in the same sequence. And the second time round, they will either expand on what they said the first time or address something that one of the other panelists has said or both, it's, it's entirely up to them. I've put up two slides myself. These are just to indicate a framework for the way I see this discussion going, but that does not mean the others see it the same way and uh, they're going to express their own views. Uh, and this framework goes as follows. You can begin uh, by essentially closing the discussion right at the start by answering the question in the following manner. You can say theoretical biology is whatever people do who call themselves theoretical biologists. So the task is simply one of asking people whether they describe themselves like that. But that's not very interesting. And besides it uh, leaves us with uh, 180 minutes, three hours with something to do. So we, we ignore that answer and move on to other possible answers. You could look at theory as a way of bringing together a number of apparently disparate ideas under one head. Then you could think of the fact that biology involves mechanisms which are really no different from those that operate in physics and chemistry. On the other hand, you can see that there's one special aspect to biology, which is an essential role for history. And that's expressed in this often quoted saying of Dobzhansky's, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And that has the consequence that causation works two ways in biology, from the bottom up, as well as from the top down. Then one could perhaps think of the relative merits of chemistry-based, physics-based, engineering-based, and information science-based approaches for understanding living systems. And the final thing in this list is that one could ask the question whether theoretical biology has to be mathematical. So there are just questions thrown up. My last slide illustrates something uh, which the distinguished ethologist Nicolas Tinbergen pointed out in a paper that is worth reading even today, where he said that living systems lend themselves to asking four questions when one looks at the level of a phenomenon or a structure, or in his case, really a behavior. One could start by asking what is the proximate, immediate cause of whatever one is seeing, a mechanistic explanation. Then one could ask what is the developmental context of what one is seeing, which is the ontogenic explanation. Then one could ask, what's the evolutionary context within which this thing is happening, which is the phylogenetic explanation. And then lastly, one can ask, and this is peculiar to biology, what is the function of what one is seeing, which is its adaptive significance. And 
explanations of the sort one and three are used in physics. And here you could think of physics in the extended sense of including geophysics, astrophysics, perhaps cosmology. One and three are also used in chemistry. Interestingly, one, two, and three are used for explaining artifacts, products of human contrivance, products of technology, but all four are used in biology. I leave this simply as, a, as, a, as something there uh, for us to think of maybe as we go on. A brief comment before I hand over uh, the proceedings to the panelists, which is that this meeting has by and large concerned itself with answering the first question in this list and to some extent the second question. Uh, we've been concentrated mostly on mechanistic explanations for features that take place inside cells or tissues sometimes during development. But we have not gone into a whole range of other issues that concern biology. And uh, I hope some of them will come up in this session or in the discussion session that follows. So thanks very much for being here. And it's my pleasure to request Apratim Mazumdar to set the proceedings going. And I remind you that I'm going to point out when 10 minutes are done so that we can move on to the next person. Thank you. I stop sharing now and request Apratim to start. You can see my screen, right? Yeah. yeah. Good. So thank you, Vidya. Uh, thank you, Vaishnavi. Thank you, Vijay, for this invitation. And thank you for thinking uh, that I would have something worthwhile to say about this very broad and deep question. Uh, the meeting has been fantastic. I've learned a lot. Of things. So, but you would understand that I feel a certain amount of trepidation and I mean, uh, you almost feel that it's uh, presumptuous of me to pontificate on this. But uh, I will come to you from a perspective of a cell biologist. And my, uh, my name is Aprati Mojumdar. I'm at this uh, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Hyderabad. So, and I've been here uh, nearly six years now. So, and uh, what is the title that is grayed out is what I work on. And so, and the temptation is great to talk about the what we do in the lab. So, but the, I understand that is not the point of this discussion. So, so as a good biologist, I have made several slides data slides and things like that, because the temptation is great to show data. But the thing is, um, then it will get to be a long discussion. So what I have said that the first, first 10 minutes, I'll just limit myself to three slides. And then eventually, subsequently, if there's time, we can look at some questions at greater depth. So, so as I said, my, my undergrad degree was in physics and BSc physics, but all my subsequent degrees are in biology. And so the, thus, I identify myself as an experimental cell biologist now. But the thing is, I'd like to think that uh, I, because coming from a physics background, uh, I'm a little more quantitative than, uh, than it, so it's not just about images, but you quantify things more. But the thing is, but theoretical biology, of course, goes way beyond that. So, and, uh, and 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 I throughout my not so long career I have appreciated that the so the, the mechanistic insight that theory can bring and the predictive value to the experiments that we do work on. So, but I myself I am not a theoretical biologist. I am a cell biologist. So I do experiments. So so the genesis of this meeting is of course this essay by Sidney Brenner, which says. Technology gives us tools to analyze organisms at all scales, but we are drowning in a sea of data and thirsting for some theoretical framework with which to understand it, right? So, which is why thirsting for theoretical biology, that's the name of this meeting, right? So, and this is true that when I was a postdoc, so some of the things that did the large scale screen in East to ask which proteins change levels or localization in 
response to DNA damage in yeast. And then with, there were 4,159 different strains of yeast. And then you asked, uh, you did a lot of microscopy and asked this question, which are the proteins whose levels are changing or whose localization is changing. But ultimately to gain understanding uh, about that, you would need to bring in theory. You would need to look at your hits in the, in the, uh, as modules, which one does with gene ontology. And, and 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 various various other bioinformatic tools, right? So 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 and so also meaning I we do a fair amount of say single molecule RNA detection in cells and so and in every case meaning beyond quantitation theory can bring in insight and, and the, because we work on stress responses these are often out of equilibrium systems and the thing is the descriptions for gene expression that we have oftentimes are for steady state conditions which may not necessarily apply. apply. So, uh, so in India, particularly, we see that there are many people who are interested in questions in biology. Oftentimes, it, uh, it, there are people who would do simulations, which of course, numerical simulations, which of course give you in, insight and give you uh, understanding about the process that one is uh, thinking about. But those are like, in silico experiments, but in a way that's not theory. Theory is something beyond. Theory is, uh, uh, is where you can abstract, uh, abstract away from the details and come up with some universal uh, phenomenon. To, and, and this is quite different from say how we biologists approach problems. So we usually have our favorite experimental biologists uh, approach problems. We usually have our favorite molecules and we love them. Say for instance, in one of the labs where I did my postdoc, the entire lab is built on working on this alkyl adenine DNA glycosylase, which of course, uh, for many of you, it would seem like that's a very specific molecule. Uh, but biologists do like to get into the details like this, like that, and oftentimes they feel that it is almost a bit disrespectful to abstract away from that detail. So, but we have seen many counter examples to that in the course of this meeting, right? So, uh, so where Pearson talked about say, this membrane distribution within the cell, abstracting away from the rats, gifts, gaps, snares, bulgins, and the different proteins which mediate that uh, membrane uh, transport within the cell. So we heard say Gotham in and talk about uh, chromosome gene density and link distribution and how that uh, affects positioning and how that in itself may be an epigenetic mechanism for 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 gene regulation and then uh, Madan Rao's work we know where we know that this subcortical actin class asters came from theory first and then they were subsequently discovered in experiments in uh, Satyajit Mayer's lab and then uh, not to embarrass uh, my co-panelist uh, Professor Shriram Ramaswamy who works on active matter and who would abstract away from the details of the schools of sardines and murmuration of sterlings, but rather look at them as active matter, which is sort of agnostic, agnostic to the ambitions, hopes and dreams of the individual fish of the bird, but rather uh, had their tendency to go from procreation to procreation. And, uh, but uh, rather look at the collective as a whole. And it's not just about fish and birds. We saw a movie from uh, Professor Sheila Janai. Humans also act as such collectives. Um, we heard from uh, Professor Iris Braun. He alluded to the Magic Mountain. And I, 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 that is a book that I also like. And so we, there, uh, Thomas Mann, he dwells on this point on what is life, right? And the thing is, are we as individuals alive or all these hallmarks of life, which is to eat, spend energy, replicate, which can be true for our collective, the society also. So then which is the unit which is alive? In biology, it becomes relevant because we know individual DNA or RNA molecules or proteins are not alive. But generally, if I take a cell out of your body, I can keep it alive in at least for a few passages, most cell types from your body, I can keep alive. So then is the cell the unit which is alive or are, am I? the unit which is alive. So at, at some point it becomes a philosophical question. So are we just then a collective of cells and then a broader society is a collective of that. So the theory lets us abstract away from the details and 
that is what is important. I have, in our institute, we don't have departments. We physicists, biologists, chemists, we are all in one department. I have a soft matter uh, statistical physics colleague, Kabir Ramona, who liquid-liquid phase separation is all the rage in cell biology these days. And he would say, oh, the physics of that is well understood. There is nothing there. But, but, but why people are excited about that is about the, because of the profound biological insight that that provides also in terms of local rea reactions. So then the value that theory brings is when it, it's to bring mechanistic insight. It has to go beyond just uh, approximately desc describing some experiment, but rather in it, it should, a good theory should have predictive value and it should hint at things of beyond what is immediately obvious to me as an experimental biologist. So that, that is what theoretical biology is to me. So, so we tend to think that the great theories are of biology, they seem to be a thing of the past, theories of evolution, say DNA structure or the genetic code. But the thing is new phenomena are being discovered in biology every day. So like splicing is as recent as 1977, RNA-mediated gene expression control by miRNAs, long, long coding RNAs. That's very much this century itself. So, and then there's all the, whole co issue of epigenetics and the positional code and chromosome packing. So, uh, uh, can I? Yeah. Uh, so I have done it here. Yeah. So, so I will I will finish up now. Uh, so I will just say that I will do well to talk to my theoretical colleagues here at TFR Hyderabad. And uh, when it, because they would have. So I'll just finish with this. It's from the same essay by Sidney Brenner where he said both Turing and von Neumann did not have any direct effect on molecular biology, but their work allows us to discipline our thoughts about machines, both natural and artificial. And so, and he, he says that uh, it's, he says it is, the, there is a distinction between the code script and the universal constructor that carries out that code script. This is, uh, like, please read through this. This is an important dis description. And uh, he, he ends with this question, which Vidya said is from, from Nico Tinbergen in the 1963 essay, but this also ends with that. How does it work? How is it built? And how did it get that way? There are problems embodied in classical fields of physiology, embryology, and evolution. And at the core of everything are the tapes containing the descriptions to build the special Turing machines. So to my mind, with theoretical biology, what we do is we find these tapes. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Pratim. You'll have the second uh, round yeah. later. Uh, Pauline, could I request you to say something, please? Um, let me see. Uh, the other screen is still shared. Yeah. It's still Can I? Um, okay. So I'm talking here as the only one who identifies as a theoretical biologist. And I'm not going to tell you what theoretical biology is because I don't know. Um, but I think we, as theoretical biologists, we have um, a, a general challenge, and that is that if we make models of biological systems, if we make any kind of model, they should be uh, simple enough, because if we don't, then, well, I mean, when we make the models very complex, they are just act as complex. Uh, well, I mean, they are as hard to study as the biological systems themselves and don't give us an other type of understanding of them. On the other hand, uh, as Einstein uh, is supposed to have said, he actually didn't say it, but that doesn't matter. Models should be as simple as possible, but not more so. And I think that in theoretical biology, we have, well, we are, um, we have to move in this conundrum. Uh, do we make models that are too simple to actually, um, well, uh, capture uh, what uh, essential uh, properties of our biological system, and, um, but are still simple enough to understand? And so you actually can ask, is this an empty cross section? Well, uh, sorry, I Pauline, think... can I interrupt very briefly? Yeah. If you, if you could uh, adjust your camera, we see only half of you. Perhaps you could, uh, that's very much better. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry for interrupting. 
Uh, okay. Um, so uh, what we uh, so we have to move on this uh, this conundrum, and on the other hand, we can uh, do some cherry picking uh, by looking at things in which we can uh, well somehow combine these two um, constraints. So I added this this slide uh, more or less at the, at the last moment, um, um, and first I had this as the first slide. Um, so. Um, well, so what we have to consider is what kind of, of properties do we look at, what kind of processes, space-time scales, specificity versus generality, and uh, how quantitative or qualitative that we want to be. I put that as QQ. People now talk about uh, QBio when they uh, mean quantitative biology, but it just stands as well for qualitative biology. Um, well, and so cherry picking. So I'm going to talk about my choices in 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 this uh, spectrum, and um, well, my choice is to look at informatic processes in uh, biotic systems. Um, already 50 years ago, Ben Esper and I. Um, uh, started to realize that, yes, it's very important to look at biological systems as chemical systems, as physical system. They undoubtedly are, and there are many uh, very interesting things to say that. Um, however, biological systems have this extra property of, um, well, being informatic systems. In fact, one of the definitions of life and therefore of what we want to do in biology, uh, given by Joyce and also uh, proclaimed by NASA, is biological systems are distinguishable from chemical systems because they contain components that have many potential alternative compositions, but adopt a particular composition based on the history of the system. In this sense, biological systems have molecular memory, genotype, which is shaped by experience selection and maintained by self-reproduction. And- Ali, Ali, sorry for the interruption. Are we supposed to be seeing slides? We can't see anything. Yeah? Oh. oh. So we can't see anything. Sorry, you have to share What did I do wrong? Something. Um, okay, uh, now I'm, uh, so I, I start, uh, well, this was my second first slide. So as I said, um, well, my choice is to go for informatic process in biotic systems. Uh, and as Ben Hesper and I proposed already 50 years ago, uh, let's make that, uh, well, our direction of research. And we called it bioinformatics. As you all know, the word bioinformatics is now uh, more used for uh, the data analysis part, but um, uh, well, I think the word actually should mean uh, the study of informatic processes in biotic systems. These, this informatic aspect uh, is actually well one way that we can define life and therewith what we want to do in biology. And as Vidya already mentioned, uh, one of the things which, which follows from that is that um, uh, unlike uh, in, well, we mostly think about that we have some kind of microscopic rules or processes which lead to some more microscopic behavior that we then can study and, and relate to these microscopic rules in an evolutionary system. Uh, we also have this, this feedback uh, through uh, selection such that uh, we also get this influence of the macroscopic behavior back on the microscopic uh, behavior. So uh, an evolutionary process is necessarily a multi-level process. And in our, uh, um, well, uh, in, in last analysis, we don't have a rock bottom. We do, of course, have the physical rock bottom, uh, but in, in the processes as, as we study, uh, so the entities that we study are um, um, the product of the, an historical process and actually, well, in many experiments, uh, change their properties as we go. And I think this is a, a very important uh, point so th uh, that we should consider in our modeling as, an, and as Vidya already said, it is sometimes called uh, top-down causation. Okay. 
Um, I want to go back. Um, and so the other, um, well, choice of mine to do a theoretical biology is to go for the, what I call experimental theoretical biology. That sounds as a, as a contradiction, but it is similar to what Ulam um, uh, proposed as experimental mathematics, which also sounds as a, as a contradiction. Um, because of the complexity of biological systems, the highly non-linearity, the non-equilibrium uh, processes that we are, are, are talking about, um, it is very important to, uh, well, to experiment, to see uh, what the consequences are of some uh, simpler formulation. So, um, uh, as uh, was just remarked, uh, when we do uh, that, many people think that when we do computer simulations, this is not real theory. Well, it can be experimental theoretical biology, and I think we can get to general insights by doing it. And uh, the trick, I think, that, that works very nicely here is um, <clears throat> to explore multiple models which have enough degrees of freedom uh, such that, um, well, uh, well that, that they can go to places where you might not expect them to go. And then see whether from multiple um, uh, initial conditions, initial assumptions, uh, approximations, because we are always in this context of, well, in a, in a way, two simple models or two complex models, and that we can discover uh, generic features uh, which emerge by self-organization and evolution. And so my, my work is to, to try to uh, discover uh, these types of things. Um, okay. Um, and uh, well, if I have time, I, uh, well, I can just be, be very uh, superficial here in what I'm telling, but I, I, because, well, when we work with these uh, computational models, we always kind of have to over-specify. That's why we uh, want to have uh, several of those, those models. Um, well, and looking at evolution, um, well, a, a very uh, well-known um, uh, uh, approach has been by Maynard Smith and Zad Meyrie, who have tried to uh, pinpoint major transitions in evolution and the common principles there. And so what uh, they, they noted was that often in important transitions in evolution, self-sufficient entities uh, became part of a whole, that we have division of labor, and that things went from limited to unlimited inheritability. And so the quote of Joyce also uh, hinted to that, uh, the, um, <clears throat> uh, where evolution actually uh, uh, became more powerful uh, uh, pa pa Pauline, may I yeah. interrupt? You think you could round off uh, this part? Pardon? Could you finish this part? Yeah. Um, so, uh, what uh, what I um, uh, well would have liked to show you, and maybe I can do that later, is that uh, we can understand all these major transitions. Uh, from a set of, um, uh, of uh, fairly simple models uh, by which we don't say we want to try to model any of these parts, but just start with some first principles, where first principles in biology are Darwinian evolution, but in a way of uh, enough uh, degrees of freedom um, and in that way, well, actually go for what I call non-supervised modeling um, uh, to get the general insights. And then, in fact, uh, can show why we had this transition from, uh, well, why we have something like DNA, uh, which is, trend so uh, where the code is uh, being stored, which then is being uh, uh, translated uh, to uh, the functional molecules and by the information transfer there is mostly unidirectional. 
let me stop there. Thank, thank you, Pauline. Uh, huh? Shri, Shri Ram, if I could request you to start. Pauline, you'll have to stop sharing your slides. Yeah. So that I, Shri, Shri Ram can begin. See whether I can do that uh, by going back. Um, There's a thing somewhere which says stop sharing. Yeah, but I don't have that screen somehow. Um, can I do that? We can we can do it remotely. If somebody can do it for me, please do. Great, great. Yeah. Right, Shriram, you're on now. Okay, now I can do it. Yeah, okay. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Thank you. Yes, Shriram. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yeah, you can. Okay, yeah, so well, um, uh, that's me, and I am a theoretical physicist. I at the Indian Institute of Science, uh, and that's my support. So um, I don't know if I should thank V, V, and V for putting me on the spot like this. Uh, I really asked myself when they asked me, why have they put me on this panel? Um, I, I really do physics. I study living materials or toy versions of living materials theoretically as a type of condensed matter. Uh, we call it active matter. There is certainly new physics in it. So if you like the major payoff from this field still to my mind has been the new physics that came out of choosing to look at collections of particles, each of which uh, takes up uh, free energy and converts it into work. Each con constituent of it has a kind of time's arrow uh, a lot of our research actually looks at artificial realizations uh, as a nice test bed for theory. I am painfully aware that physics and biology involves both information and mechanics, and the information is both sort of proximate in time, like signaling, sensing, and so forth, as well as over one generation, like self-replication, and over evolutionary time scales. And the success of the particular kind of um, physics I do related to biological systems has been to ignore all these interesting complexities and focus only on mechanics, on the fact that these are driven systems with the uh, internal forces like contractility, whose manifestations like motility are the things that we study. This is the kind of stuff I work on. And apparently, Vidyanand Vijay and uh, Vaishnavi decided that someone working on this is worth having on this panel. So thank you, but I hope you don't regret it. All right, why are we discussing this now? Well, there's the obvious reasons uh, that we can really measure so many more things in such spectacular detail compared to what we could do earlier. We can ask questions in quantitative, not just quantitative detail, but about me mechanically interesting properties, forces, flows, fluctuations inside systems. And so for physicists who claim to be experts at studying collective phenomena, Obviously, biology is the ultimate collective phenomenon, so we feel the urge to study this. So this is why we're doing this stuff. Um, so rather than answer what is, what is theoretical biology, uh, I thought I it would be amusing to say, you know, you could ask the same question about physics. What is theoretical physics? And even though uh, Vidyanand said we shouldn't say this, we should repudiate this idea, I'll say what is theoretical physics? It's what theoretical physicists do. And what is that? Well, you look at physics departments. You look at theory groups or theoretical physics departments. I don't think theory should be done in separate departments, but still. And when you look at them, you find a huge number of diverse activities ranging from quantum matter to econophysics and all kinds of things in between. So what happens? So here is a little computer experiment I did yesterday, which is to try to answer the same question by saying, well, theoretical biology is what theoretical biologists do and to try to look at theoretical biology departments. And I swear to God, if you, if you Google Department of Theoretical Biology, you find about two and a half of them on the net. So it's clear that theoretical biology departments are not where most theory activity in biology happens. Uh, maybe I didn't look hard enough. Uh, Vidyanand will know one famous instance, which is at the University of Chicago, where I think such a department was started and then probably ceased to exist. Anyway, so it's clear that theoretical biology is done in places other than theoretical biology departments. So what do we do when we do theory? We make a limited observation. From it, we distill a conceptual or mathematical description uh, in answer to Vidyanand's point, a question about whether theory has to be mathematical. 
I think theory has to be mathematical in the sense that if you find there are many factors contributing to something, then in order to figure out how to combine them, you need an algebra of things that you observe. So they have to be measurable and combinable. And in that sense, unless theory is mathematical, it won't be able to sort which of multiple factors acting in a given situation matters. And then obviously you want to predict and test. But you know, normally when you predict based on a model built from limited observations, you then apply those predictions well in a parameter regime, well outside the domain of your initial observation. The trouble with biology is that the values of parameters for which the system of interest even exists are, have typically been constrained by evolution. So uh, even this sort of classic sense of making a prediction and testing it becomes a bit awkward. So one of the escape routes is to do in vitro experiments in which you can move parameters around a good deal more. But actually, all theoreticians should admit that in practice, very often, they don't do this classic official theory where you test predictions. Very often, you have an experimental observation, and you actually work very hard simply to come up with a calculation within existing theory, which makes sense of this observation. And then, of course, you can timidly go from there to really testing predictions. But there's another thing, and I think uh, Pauline actually mentioned this. Sometimes what you do is based on theories formulated on general grounds, you come up with a general effect or a general mechanism. And then you say, you know, somewhere in the world of the systems of interest, in this case, living systems, that general mechanism must be taking place. Why would nature not take advantage of such a cool idea or something like that? So a lot of theory is actually this third kind, where you invent a general mechanism and look for it somewhere. Um, I don't really need to put this slide up. Uh, examples of theory and biology uh, over the uh, decades or centuries uh, are include evolution, include pattern formation, population dynamics, and a zillion other things. And you know, in each of these, there are great successes. And some of these correspond to uh, observation, build a theory and test it. Some of these actually, like Turing, correspond to uh, coming up with a general idea for patterns, which may not turn out to operate in the situation to which where you thought about it, but operate somewhere. Uh, uh, let me say a few words about my own experience. Uh, I seem to be talking too fast, but maybe it's OK. Uh, my own experience in areas abutting biology had to do with our asking the general question. Supposing you have a fluid medium in which you've got a bunch of creatures that move around and have some sort of orientation, some sort of sense of direction. How would you write a theory of that system? What's different about these guys? It's that they're made of these active particles. Each particle takes up power and moves and does something. So it turns out that the answer was to build the equations of the hydrodynamics of liquid crystals, but with a difference in that the system is made of powered particles. So we did that quite a long time ago. And the reason it turns out to be important for biology is not, the, not merely the work that we did and which was tested in some sort of carefully designed experiments, but that the, precisely these equations reappear a couple of years later in work from Paris and Dresden building the hydrodynamic theory for the cytoskeleton with complete intent to understand the mechanics of the cell. So this illustrates two things. One, the importance, the, the important constraint that general symmetries and conservation laws place on the kinds of equations that can emerge. And two, on the idea that you can ask a general question saying, look, if you've got a system that's out of equilibrium and made of orientable things and has some kind of motorized degrees of freedom, what will the theory be? And you may write it down for motile organisms, but others rediscover it in, on much smaller scales, and the same equations really apply. And this has offered, to some degree, a predictive understanding of what happens in the cytoskeleton. And there are many papers on it. And Madan Rao, Rao's talk uh, in this conference, for example, was about these ideas. So um, let me actually close by talking about what we, you know, yeah. What is theoretical biology is really not the question. The question is, what would we like theoretical biology to be? First of all, we don't want it to reproduce in excruciating detail what the physical system does. And there's, I think, a literary critic who said it in a rather amusing way, which I put up here. Uh, so to some degree, uh, the, the important question is, you've got a very complicated system with, with a vast number of participants. And what you would like to know is, how can I take step back and take the large scale view what variables out of the many combinations of the individual variables must matter on large scales? 
what variables can be ignored or put into noise. Secondly, even though this first point about which variables matter is well explored in the context of dead systems and even to some degree of success in the context of active systems, the question that really hasn't been answered is that when you've got living matter that's been shaped by evolution, are there properties of the mechanical degrees of freedom of systems that have evolved that make them different and that give you new criteria for choosing the slow variables embodying the coarse grain description of these systems. And lastly, I wanted to say that I think one way of making progress in the general enterprise of theoretical biology is not only for biologists to acquire an appreciation of physics, which I think they have, it's for physicists to grow up seeing examples of physics effects in a specifically biological context. Uh, and that's all I wanted to say at uh, this stage. Thank you. Th th thanks very much, Sri Ram. Um, could, if you unshare uh, your slides, yeah. could I request uh, Francesca to take up, please? <clears throat> Francesca, are you ready? I'm trying to do that. Um, no, sorry. I don't know, it worked before and now. Um, sorry, just a minute. Nope. I don't know why it went. Yes, okay. Can you see it? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. So thank you very much for the invitation. I'm Francesca Merlin. And I do philosophy of life sciences uh, in Paris, in France. So it, it's really a very nice uh, meeting. Uh, and it, 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 it's really a good idea, I think, to try to trigger dialogue between uh, experimental biologists and theoretical biologists. And in my intervention here, I would like to trigger dialogue between uh, philosophers and uh, biologists, in particular philosophers and theoretical biologists. So, um, I cannot change the slide. I don't know why. Yeah. So I, I said I, I, I do philosophy of life sciences. And so uh, I, I, I'm, just, I'm going to say something about, about that, about what is uh, philosophy of life sciences. And you will see that it, that's a connection with uh, theoretical biology. So I could provide the general definition of what uh, philosophy of life sciences is. But there are at least two styles of two traditions that have been identified and distinguished by several authors. And I rely on the way a French philosopher of life sciences, Jean Gaillon, distinguished them. So um, you, you have to know first that the, these two styles are two different ways of conceiving the relationship between philosophy and biology. And so different ways of interpreting the task of philosophers of life sciences. Uh, so the first tradition, I, I will be quick, is what is usually called the HPS, History, History and Philosophy of Biology, which is the uh, continental style. It's a style rooted into the historical critical method. Um, and uh, it is focused on the, on the genesis of uh, concepts, of biological concepts. And it's interesting in the living, generally speaking. So it's open to also topics related to medicine and also to ethical issues. So it's a dualist tradition, dualist, dualist style, uh, because philosophy and science are uh, conceived as being uh, uh, different. They have different nature and different uh, tasks. And philosophy is a sort of a priori, a posteriori, sorry, reflection on the development uh, and the present and past content of, of science. So in this case, in the case of this tradition, uh, philosophy is external to uh, biology. The second style is what is usually called philosophy of biology, and it's the analytic style. Um, uh, um, this style is not uh, interested in the history of uh, biology, even though history is considered as interesting per se, but it's something that you have to do uh, in a distinct way. Uh, philosophy of biology is focused on uh, conceptual puzzles of contemporary uh, biology, science as it is currently done, and there is uh, no reflection uh, about medicine. It's less true today, but it's not uh, the topic of, of my intervention uh, today. So this, this style is a unitarian style. The idea is that there is no difference in nature between 
philosophical knowledge and scientific biological knowledge. So philosophy, of course, is more uh, conceptual and is primarily construed as a meta discourse, but also philosophy has to confront uh, its solutions to empirical data. And on the other side, biology is more empirical than philosophy, but also it is conceptual and critical. So according to this style, philosophers and biologists are involved in the same fight, which is solving the conceptual and theoretical puzzles of biology and compare them with experimental data. So uh, the question is open whether it is the relationship between philosophy and biology here is internal or external, because as I said, as a meta discourse, philosophy is in some way external to biology because it asks questions about uh, biological concepts, uh, biological practices and methods. But at the same time, as I said, they are philosophy and biology here are involved in the same project, in the same fight. So maybe the relation is uh, internal to in a certain way. So now if you focus on the second style, uh, which is more similar, more, next to uh, biology, we could, we could say that there is a sort of continuum between philosophy of biology, uh, and in particular where biology is more theoretical. So the question I'm going to ask is, to, to answer to the general question, what is theoretical biology, is do philosophy of biology and theoretical biology overlap or even uh, coincide? And so first I'm going to say something about philosophy of biology and then uh, um, about theoretical biology. So. Uh, in order to answer to this question, let us look at, this is one of the founding papers of philosophy of biology, the analytic style, the second style, by David Hull, which is one of the main uh, philosophers of biology. And in this paper, uh, which is called What Philosophy of Biology Is Not, he argues against a certain way of doing philosophy of biology at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, which was a way of doing philosophy of biology in the same way we they, philosophers did philosophy of physics, because physics at the, the time was considered as the paradigmatic uh, science. And Hull argues that uh, biology uh, does not raise the same kind of problems as uh, physics, and we have to make philosophy of biology in, in a different way. Biology has its own different uh, problems. And then he concludes by saying what philosophy of biology might be, and he says, I quote, there are many things that philosophy of biology might be. A philosopher might uncover, explicate, and possibly solve problems in biological theory and methodology. He might even go on to communicate these results to other philosophers, to scientists, and especially to biologists. And then he continues, and this is the part I, I, I find interesting. He might show what consequences biological phenomena and theories have for other sciences and for philosophy, or to show what consequences other sciences and even philosophy have for biology. So what he's saying here is that philosophy looks for the big picture. And this is an idea you can find in the philosophical literature about philosophy. For instance, you have a quotation here by, by the philosopher Wilfred Sellers, who says, the aim of philosophy abstractly formulated is to understand how things in the broadest possible sense of the term hang together in the broadest possible sense of the term. More recently, you have uh, in the handbook by Peter Godfrey Smith, a philosopher of biology, it's a handbook uh, about the philosophy of biology. He also says that philosophy looks for an overall picture of what the world is like and how we fit into it in an especially broad uh, way. So philosophy is seen as a, an incubator of theoretical ideas and the, the place for speculation. And more precisely, Peter Gottfried Smith says that philosophy of biology is both interested in, in the living world, nature, and in the human investigation of the living world, which is uh, biology. And more, more precisely, um, as interested in, in, in nature, in the living world, it's a sort of philosophy of nature, and science here is a sort of instrument, a lens to look at the natural world. And as an investigation of, the, of, the, of biology, uh, philosophy of biology is philosophy of science, a meta discourse, as I said before, on science, and science is a subject matter. So from here, we could conclude uh, that um, uh, philosophy of biology have a broader scope and objective with respect to biology, which is to look at the big picture. However, I, I, I have doubt and I ask, uh, is this really the case? What about theoretical biology? What does theoretical biology look for? And this question brings us to the question of this panel, which is what is uh, theoretical biology? 
And in order to answer to it, I, I, I want to uh, look at this paper by uh, Corin Waddington, 68. It's a paper um, when he where he presents uh, two meetings uh, uh, that were held in 66 and 67 uh, at the instigation of the International Union of Biological Sciences. And he, he, tried, he tries to answer to the, this question, what is theoretical biology? But first he, he says, he recalls that theoretical physics uh, was a well-recognized discipline at that time and today too. And he says that uh, um, there's profound consequences for uh, problems of general philosophy and it is well not acknowledged, sorry. Uh, then he claims that uh, one of the aim of these two meetings he's talking about is to explore the possibility of formulating a skeleton of concepts and methods around which theoretical biology can grow. And then he characterizes what he means by theoretical biology. And he says, um, the intention was at these meetings uh, that the discussions would be concerned not with the theory of particular biological processes such as membrane, permeability, genetics, neural relativity, and so on, but rather with an attempt to discover and formulate general concepts and logical relations characteristic of living as contrasted with organic systems. And further with a consideration of any implications these might have for general philosophy. So it seems to me that if you compare David Hull's characterization of philosophy of biology and Waddington's of theoretical biology, they seem to talk about the same thing, the, the same kind of, of philosophical and scientific work. On the one hand, the investigation about biology, and on the other hand, investigation about the philosophical implications of, of biology, of biological phenomena and biological theory. In a book uh, in 61, Waddington uh, uh, qualified the theoretical biology as natural philosophy. And what it is natural philosophy is a sort of speculative philosophy uh, grounded on scientific data, of course, but looking for, uh, for the big picture I, I talked before. So, uh, and the, the objective of theoretical biology as natural philosophy is to, to this speculation, uh, the, the previous speaker said, talk about uh, inventing a general mechanism. This is a sort of uh, speculation, a philosophical speculation in a, in a positive sense. So uh, theoretical biology looks at for general principles governing the structure, the development, the behavior and the evolution of living systems. So in fact, theoretical biology looks also for the big picture. So my answer to this question of the panel's question is, and I, I, I'm going to conclude, is that theoretical biology is a sort of scientific or biological philosophy. It's where biology meets philosophy and biologists meet philosophers. Philosophers doing philosophy of biology in this analytic style, Unitarian uh, style. I have more time or I have to stop here. Yeah, I think it's a good idea maybe to stop because you I, I just uh, come back some, again. Some questions, both philosophical and biological, but I can talk about them later. Thanks. Thank, thanks a lot, Francesca. Um, as I said before, we'll continue with the second round of 10 minute presentations now. And uh, I hope people don't mind holding on until the second session after all this is over to put their questions and have uh, have um, discussions with the panel members. Uh, Apratim, if you could care to begin again, please. Apratim, you're muted. Sorry, you're so muted. So, meaning in the, I do have some slides, but right now they seem a little bit specific to me, I'll go over it, but uh, you also, as you said, I'd probably uh, take up some of the points that uh, Sriram, Francesca, and Pauline raised. So, but anyway, just as a placeholder, I'll have the slides on. Right. So to me, to my mind, what it seems uh, from some of these discussions is, uh, is that it's the objective of theoretical biology is uh, to look for the big picture, the general principles and look for the big picture. And Shriram alluded to this fact that what he does is actually new physics. But the thing is, my question to Shriram would be then that is new physics needed? But the thing is, if the question is biological, sometimes even old physics has not been applied to uh, 
to biological problems, right? So even if it does not teach new physics, could it not be a worthwhile endeavor? So, so, so because and a lot of it stems from a difference in culture, right? So the physicist always looks for a for the broad general principles, whereas the biologist likes to delve into the details and their favorite molecules and uh, and and do it look at it in great great detail but uh, of course even at this point biology does not have the depth uh, that physics it's more a I mean, it has a lot of horizontal breadth but does not have the depth that physics currently does right so I'll, um, and as we said that uh, the whole lot of data is being generated right now, right? I'm just picking examples from the kind of works that I did because those are the ones that I'm most familiar with. But as you know, that it is all applicable for a lot of biology that huge data sets are being generated for which we made and we have just about beginning to quantify this. But then this, even I, to so many terabytes of data imaging data and so which proteins interact with which proteins, which proteins change levels and localization in response to DNA damage. That is uh, something that I work on. But the thing is, eventually then ultimately when you look, want to look at the response of the system, so then uh, you have to bring all of it together and which is the purpose of theoretical biology, which is, goes beyond just doing the experiments, right? So with what I feel is that I don't extract as much as I could from my data. So, so that's say so, so big data is one thing and also but even individual experiments, right? So let us, in the lab, we look at uh, single cell responses to DNA damage, that's, that's a detail, but the thing is, the, and the message there is that uh, they, the advantage that you have, instead of looking at just the mean as you would in classical biochemistry, you also have access to the distribution. And of course the distribution with here is quite different from the distribution here. They might have the same means, but the underlying biology is uh, quite different. And this, this single cell methods allow, whether it's single cell sequencing or single cell imaging, uh, allows you access to that. So, and uh, we have been in the lab, as, uh, we have been quantifying a lot of the single cell responses where we can now, uh, particularly coming back to say, Professor Gotham Menon's talk, where he was talking about subnuclear positions of chromosomes depending on gene density and expression. A lot of those uh, studies are done using uh, using bulk data for gene expression and uh, and looking at uh, imaging data for the positions of the chromosomes what we can now do is in the same cell we can integrate gene position and look at it look at the expression from that uh, gene on a cell by cell basis so we have access to both gene position and gene expression on a cell by cell basis like uh, biologists do it would show you some nice pictures but what we can do is also quantify it over hundreds and thousands of cells and the thing is uh, this is as far as we have gotten but to get more out of this one does need theory and so and so for example here are some this is that this is where mammalian cells but here are some um, uh, uh, here are some uh, some distributions in each cells. What you see in white may be the distributions in undamaged cells. When you cause DNA damage, it becomes a nicely bimodal distribution. If you did not know what the underlying processes were, it would seem interesting, but in this case, it just parses out according to the cell cycle stage. And, so, and we do simple things like plotting the factor is the variance by mean of a distribution. And, uh, and that would be, if gene expression was a Poisson process, that would be one. And then you see that under conditions of stress, this fan factor tends to go up, noise in gene expression goes up. And uh, so, but what is the functional end of this? So that we do not know. Usually physicists, when they do, when they address biological problems, they are compounded by the level of noise. But and, and recently, as most of you know that there is uh, there has been uh, this lot of excitement about noise in gene expression, but it has been for purposes of development. The fact that I have five fingers in my hand is because 
the developmental programs are robust to noise. So usually biologists would regard as a noise as a is as something bad. Whereas physicists would see you'll try to look for uh, examples where it's used to a functional end and which is something that people like Yannick Ondev, uh, Alexander Van Oden, Nathan Jim Collins, Michael Owitz and others have done. But the thing is, it, the, a clear example where noise is used to a functional end are still relatively few work. And so we, there are many examples where you have incidental noise, but we, uh, where it's used to a functional end, the examples for that are relatively few work. And so, so, so a lot of these approaches, then it, there seems to be a difference between how a biologist would regard, would want a reproducible outcome and want less noise and a physicist would try to look at how the noise might be exploited and generally try to come up with general principles for biological systems, which uh, as you said, despite all the details of biological systems, as we saw in the, all the talks throughout the I have many pages of notes, throughout the course of this meeting that while we biologists love our favorite molecules, they, you can abstract away from that and try to arrive at general principles. And can, uh, can, we, can we can we yeah. move on now, Pratip, if you don't mind? Yeah, yeah. right. So yeah, we, I suppose we can move on. But the thing is, uh, again, I will come back to this again, I think, so that- uh, Yeah, uh, you, could, you could do that later while responding. Thank you. Pauline, if you would like to uh, carry on. Yeah. Uh, let me share the screen now. Uh, Pratim will have one share, yes. Yeah, yeah. Share. So is my screen now up? Yes. Do you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, we do. Okay. Um, okay, um, so, um, well, just to hook on to the previous speaker who was uh, emphasizing in, in uh, via Brenner, uh, this analogy with uh, the Turing machines and Turing tapes. Um, and so uh, Turing, uh, the tape and the machine uh, which, which interact. So in, in biology, that's of course uh, realized uh, in a certain way uh, in the relation to DNA and what is uh, further happening in the cell. And as um, uh, was mentioned before, um, uh, well, when we look at a cell as active matter or so, um, we can see what the DNA uh, um, adds to that as, as a certain constraint. The kind of question I uh, uh, wanted to uh, well uh, to show something on uh, well what biology uh, what theoretical biology or experimental theoretical biology can do is to understand why we have um, well this this separation and as uh, uh, well Crick's dogma uh, is that uh, we have. Um, uh, the mainly unidirectional information flow from the DNA to the rest of the uh, machinery. And that the, the feedback is only uh, through evolution. And so what uh, we did, and especially Namuto uh, Takeuchi did, is study with a number of uh, different uh, models, which are all very simple models, but uh, which uh, start out with the possibility of reverse transcript days. So that's to say that uh, um, uh, RNA is being reverse transcri transcribed into DNA, um, where the models actually, uh, well, the, the assumptions of the models are really quite different, but they all converge to the same principle that we have the unidirectional information flow. They, and they do it all in a little bit different way, uh, but they have a lot in common. And uh, so to, to be short, I'll, I'll go to the conclusions and maybe uh, go back to, to some of the things. So what we see is because we find this in this, uh, well, a wide variety of models, uh, we can conclude uh, going from specific cases to general properties. And so we see 
that in all these models, we get this division of labor between information storage and information use. And um, that uh, the, what is doing the information storage is there in a minority. Um, and so that, of course, we see also in the DNA, we just have one copy of each, each gene or uh, mostly in, in the DNA and then a lot, a lot of proteins and messenger RNA, RNA, which actually do the work and this uh, unidirectional information flow. So, um, and very importantly, uh, we see that this evolves not because of a functional advantage, there is actually a functional disadvantage in many of our models, but um, that um, it is for evolutionary reasons that this, is, uh, uh, that this evolves and is uh, maintained by evolution. And the, um, well, the, the, the major mechanism which works in, in all uh, the different models is that it evolves uh, as a conflict, evolu uh, a conflict resolu resolution between uh, different levels of selection. So I would say, say that one of the defining properties, and I think everybody will agree with that, of biological systems is that we have all these levels of organization. Um, and uh, well, uh, and that, uh, well, there, there can be uh, these conflicts between these levels. These conflicts are uh, alleviated by this unidirectional information flow. And so in, in this slide, um, where this is of, of one of the, the uh, one of the models that, uh, that we are comparing here, where we have uh, the uh, molecular interactions uh, modeled in a cerebral automaton, but uh, on top of the molecular interactions, there are these cells, models with the so-called cell or hot uh, 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 mechanism where, uh, where, where there are a, a number of them enclosed uh, within uh, uh, particular space, and there is uh, the selection between the molecules as well as uh, between uh, these cells. Now, uh, when this uh, the DNA has invaded and actually uh, 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 established this unidirectional information flow, nevertheless, in single cells, the DNA can be lost just by stochastic uh, reasons. And what we see when that happens is that these DNA, these, these cells without DNA, which just have RNA replicators, actually win out. So this, 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 this bunch increases. However, after a while, it shrinks again. And so why is that? This is uh, to, to see. So is uh, that it actually not having the DNA has a direct functional advantage. However, in this case, the um, uh, catalytic power of the RNAs is um, reduced because it has this conflict it, uh, that it, well, it, it wants to be uh, reproduced itself. So they don't want, they don't want to reproduce something else, somebody else because that costs time. And, um, and so the catalytic power is being reduced. Therefore, uh, in the end, these DNA less cells um, uh, lose out, and the ones with DNA, where DNA doesn't have this functional um, um, uh, constraints, uh, but can keep the information for strong catalysts win. So I think that gives an interesting view on uh, functionality that we have to think about evolutionary functionality as well. I think this example, so I chose this example, um, um, in order, uh, well, to, to emphasize that we can, um, uh, well, uh, go to, to very general um, insights and very fundamental insights in biology. So uh, this unidirectional information flow was put by tricks as a dogma. So that's what we see. And I think through these, um, uh, well, through having um, multiple models, which are not designed um, to, uh, to a particular function, uh, but which we let freely evolve, 
but being just slightly more um, uh, complex than what most evolutionary biology and population biology and population genetics has been doing. Um, that is to allow for uh, multi multiple levels, either to emerge by self-organization or to put them in the model. And um, we see that this dogma is now seen as a generic uh, property, which is not just an, uh, well, an observation, uh, but is understood at a, deep, a deeper level. Thank, thank you, Pauline. Could we? Yeah, we can move on. Call a hold it. Now, yeah. um, there seems to be a proposal that we already take questions from the audience. That's and fine. I want to put this specifically to Sriram and uh, Francesca. Can we do so? It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. We can talk later. Is that okay with both of you? That might give you a break as well. You can, of course, carry on in the second part. And I hope you will. Uh, but for the moment, perhaps we can stop for a moment and stop for a while and see what questions there are. Let me look in the chat box. There are a few. Uh, I can see Lee Altenberg. Lee, could you unmute yourself and uh, or shall I shall I read your question? Lee, are you there? Aloha, can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Uh, yes, greetings to everybody. Um, greetings. Simple question. Uh, physics departments feel obligated to have theoreticians and so do economics departments, but uh, most notably biology departments do not. And I think uh, most biology departments don't have theoreticians. So what is the reason or reasons, historical reasons, thematic reasons for that? Well, uh, I don't know who wants to answer, but I'll take a chance on saying a couple of words myself. Uh, I think it was Sriram who said something about theoretical biology at the University of Chicago. Now, <laughs> that's a long history. Uh, basically, what happened, and this was in the late 1930s, really, and early 1940s, carried on from there. Uh, the person by the name of Nicholas Rashevsky, uh, highly talented Ukrainian, wanted to begin a formal discipline which he called mathematical biology and sometimes mathematical biophysics. Uh, and he set this up at the University of Chicago. What happened there has been amply documented. The crux of it is that uh, there was a huge, gigantic misunderstanding and miscommunication between him, his attitude, and the way the biologists thought what they wanted from theory. Uh, so the program lingered on for many years and finally, I think, uh, died a natural death. But the question touches on something deeper, which uh, I have sensed over the years, which is an inability of uh, biologists and in particular physicists, uh, because they are the people I'm most in touch with. There's been an inability of biologists and physicists to really see the other's point of view. And uh, this has led to all kinds of things. The, historian of science and biologist herself, Evelyn Keller, describes this by using the phrase, the hubris of physics, not physicists, of physics. And she says that has rubbed biologists the wrong way. I think there's a great deal of, uh, great deal of uh, truth in that. So I suspect historically, this has been a major factor in their not being departments of theoretical biology. But what is happening now is rather interesting, which is that physicists who are doing problems connected with living matter are creating enough of a ferment amongst themselves for in a way a successful process of budding out to take place. And as a result, you have very interesting physics being done related to biological matter. So you could call it theoretical biology, 
but it's being done not necessarily in biology departments, but in physics departments, and quite often in engineering departments. So, sorry, that's a rather long uh, answer. Perhaps someone else might also like to say something. Um, Vijayanand, could I say something? Yeah. Yeah. No, so I, I just to amplify your point, I think the, the, the point is that it just happens that maybe biology departments aren't the most fruitful place for a physicist to apply their trade studying biology questions because the physicists work well when they have other physicists to talk with. And so the model that you just described of activity with serious relevance, theoretical activity with serious relevance to biology taking place in settings where it grows, in chemistry departments, in physics departments, in applied maths departments, and so forth. But in constant contact with biology, probably is the natural way for it to go forward. And I think the, you know, the, the answer to Lee Altenberg's question is that uh, uh, it's happening. Rather than uh, theoretical biology, the theorists in biology departments, you have them in these other more, um, not hospitable, but more, more functionally uh, viable settings. Thanks. Uh, Sandhya, is your uh, raised hand a comment on this question? Yes, so, Sandhya, I, can I? Could can you I, please? Could you I please? honestly be part of it. <laughs> Pardon, so, yeah, sorry, Pauline, you had something. Yeah. Okay, sir. Well, I just wanted to say that I'm happily embedded in a biology department. And I do think that has uh, advantages. Um, uh, um, because well, because of many reasons, but I think, um, uh, well, it's uh, important to think for a theoretical biology uh, from a basis of biology rather than from a basic basis of physics. Um, and so that was a, a part of what I meant with my cherry picking, uh, which cherries do we pick? Do we pick the cherries for which we have um, well, our physical, uh, our tools from physics, well, that's fine, that's beautiful, and there's beautiful results. Um, however, um, uh, well, there are other cherries to pick, and within biology and within, um, well, the, the, the fundamental questions within biology, I think it is, it's very good to be embedded in a biology department. Thanks. Okay, that's what I wanted to... Sandhya, you had something you to say? Uh, I, Vidya, actually, a couple of things, because earlier when we had a panel discussion last, you made and yeah, your voice you is know, not physics through. and other, oh, okay, can you hear me better now? Yeah. Can you hear me better now? Yeah. Okay. So, um, Vidya, you had made the point, and I thought this very, uh, very useful that physics or quantitative or engineers or quantitative approaches can be brought to bear on biological problems. So I think in terms of, I was just asking a question, is it necessary to think of um, quantitative approaches as only theory? Um, because I think if you have a slight expanded, uh, if you look at areas of ecology, like you had pointed out that day, and neuroscience, there has been a lot of theory uh, and a lot of quantitative approaches uh, that have come in. In fact, there are a lot of physicists in, in neuroscience, and I'm sort of aware of that area only because I am a neuroscientist neurobiologist and I tend to read. And I think that to say that um, there are theoretical people embedded, not as many theoretical people embedded in biology departments who are doing cell biology or the kinds of biology that was covered in this meeting would be my perspective. I think India is slightly different, but at least in the US, which I'm more familiar with, lots of departments had people who would use theoretical approaches for their problems of interest. It is generally true that, uh, as Aprothi mentioned, that biologists love to 
uh, sort of dive into the details because often context in biological uh, problems seems to matter in how the system is and how the parts are used to give rise to an output. Um, but, and I think therefore both sides need to learn how to talk to each other and it takes time. You need to spend a fair bit of time investing in learning to talk to each other. So, thanks. Uh, could, could I request Francesca to briefly comment on this point of uh, quantitation in theory, the importance of quantitation in theory and whether uh, it's possible, in her opinion, to do theory non-quantitatively? Yeah. Um, I would say um, about, um, I think that many, I mean, many talks today and many comments uh, sent us back to um, Richard Lewin's, you, you talked about Chicago, so Richard Lewin's um, um, paper in 66, the strategy of model building, it was in population genetics, in population biology. And it does this, he talks about this um, necessary trade-off between uh, among uh, three features that are uh, precision, um, generality, and realism. Precision, in fact, is, uh, is to, to refers to the quantitative aspect of, of, of models. Um, and so he says that there's, there's a necessary trade-off. You cannot have a model that is uh, at the same time realist, precise, and, and, and general. You cannot. You, you cannot just have, you can just have, uh, if you have a, a model which is really precise and general, you ca it cannot be realist. Um, uh, so I think that the, the answer to the, the, the question about the quantitative qualitative aspect is in this, uh, in this, uh, in this sort of triangle he, he talks about in this, uh, this trade-off. And uh, um, I have the impression that uh, 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 works uh, done by uh, uh, physicists, I come back to this, this aspect about uh, physicians doing, uh, doing theoretical biology. Uh, in fact, are, uh, the models they produce are less realist and more uh, precise and, and general. So they are uh, quantitative models uh, that, that tries to be to, to uh, to be general and to identify general principles. Uh, but I think it's, it's possible also to have uh, qualitative models that are not so precise, but maybe more a little bit more realistic and, and at the same time uh, general. So I think that really uh, Lewin's um, um, gave a real nice way of, of, uh, of uh, seeing the, the way um, we build uh, models in, in, in biology and more generally in, in science, I think. And also another aspect that was uh, raised by, I think by uh, Pauline, um, it's about uh, um, robustness. Uh, Pauline said that uh, one way to work in theoretical biology is to, to build multiple models that start from initial conditions. So you, get, you try to, uh, to change initial conditions and see where, whether you can discover some generic property. So um, Lewins talks about the same thing, this, this, uh, the fact that uh, when we, we do uh, models, we try to uh, find robust properties, robust theorems, robust results uh, that uh, you can produce from uh, using different models, even models that are different uh, in their assumptions. And if the result is the same, this, this means that there's something objective, something uh, uh, true in a certain way. Uh, so this, this is another uh, concept, I think, uh, we, we should discuss uh, um, the, the concept of robustness. Uh, very, very interesting. Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, we are uh, running short of time for this session, but there's one more raised hand. So let's take this last brief comment or question before we close. Uh, Monday, could you please unmute yourself and put your question? Yeah, yeah um, um, my uh, question goes this way. Um, if you look at it quantitatively, um, um, a, a physics uh, plays, plays a crucial role in, 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 in quantitative and in, uh, uh, I'm, 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 so, I'm sorry, can I, can I, can I interrupt? Your, your voice isn't coming through well. Would you mind typing the question? If it's brief, then I can read it out on your behalf. 
Oh, 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 okay, can you hear me clearly now? Uh, slightly better. Okay. Can you hear me clearly now? Yeah, slightly better. Okay, okay. please go on. So, um, uh, yeah, quantitatively, uh, uh, the uh, theoretical biologies uh, would, would work smoothly with, with a few living, like uh, like what the last speaker said. I'm, it, I'm, I'm, it is a I'm sorry, the, of, the voice of is... Of science, of, sorry, of sorry. Discovery. Hello? Sorry, the voice is fading out. Would you mind typing the question? Yeah, yeah. Could you type it in the chat box? Okay, 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 okay. Please, thank you. Okay, okay, I'll do that. I'll, I'll do that. Sandhya, is your hand still raised or have you forgotten to take it down? So, Vidya, if I may, just a, just a small point. I think is it, well, in India, so oftentimes we see that this, things, this thing is changing. As you know that uh, many of you are a part of the Simon Center at NCBS, which NCBS, if you regard it as sort of a biology department, it has a, a group of people who are interested in theoretical problems. But in the rest of India, it oftentimes seems that biologists have a sort of predatory, almost parasitic relationship with the theoretical people where you have an experiment and you just want something to approximate theory, a simulation which will approximate that, and then you get your uh, name on the paper. Okay. So the thing is, in that way, it's almost like a technical service facility, but that is not what theoretical biology is or should be, right? But it should be more like, uh, Madan said it's about more than about just getting your name on a paper. Okay. So at the, at, at the least, it's a very major way of exploring the phase, phase of possibilities, which we as experimentalists cannot always do. And at more, at, uh, at more than that, probably, it lets you come up with general principles and mechanistic ideas. So it gives you true insight, right? So it is true that we do need more people who are interested in this theoretical biology, not just as a technical service unit, which will just reproduce some of the experimental results, but something that allows us to explore the phase space of possibilities and make useful predictions. Right. Okay. Uh, Monday, your question hasn't come through yet. Well, in the meanwhile, let me read this addendum from Lee. He says, so there's an addendum to his earlier question. He says, no departments feel obligated to hire theoretical biologists who almost always get originally hired to do something else. Thus, I believe this, I believe, is a great impediment to the field. What do we do about it? So he's reiterating his earlier point, which is that theoretical biologists are not hired as theoretical biologists. Uh, Pauline, uh, you know, since you well, seem to be an exception to this general yeah, policy this, rule, this is certainly an could exception. you say something? <laughs> so, um, but um, so what was, I was rather shocked was what was just said that, uh, that theoretical biology is sometimes seen as somebody who wants to have uh, uh, the name on, a, on an experimental paper. I really found that um, shocking. <laughs> I don't know that kind of uh, theoretical biologist. And so I, I agree very much with uh, him that uh, we should do something else in theoretical biology. Indeed, explore a set of possibilities which maybe cannot be uh, addressed very easily by uh, by experiments, and um, well, uh, so I think that that's a, that's a, a very useful remark. But if it is true that when that somebody is hired in a biological department, um, actually just to do that thing, which shouldn't be, that is to say, to have just a little bit of a uh, well. A, Somebody said sometimes, um, uh, well, it's, it's just uh, we, we calculate a, 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 a statistical value, although it is entirely 
superfluous because our results are very clear, but we have to have that, that, uh, that statistics in to be respectable. And somebody said, well, it's, it's getting to it that to be respectable, you have to have a little bit of a simulation in it. Um, and so when that is the reason that more theoretical minded people are being hired, I think that would be an, a, a very bad thing. <laughs> I mean, because that, that would, um, well, not, um, well, not the best uh, function of theoretical biology. With respect to this hiring, I think the same is true for physicists who do think, think, things related to biology. They are mostly not hired for that. They are mostly hired for doing some physics. So in that sense, this is a symmetrical situation. Thanks, uh, Pauline. Now let's quickly go to the last question after which we take a break. This is from uh, uh, Monday, Sunday, Adi Aha. Uh, he says, I have done a gene separation in many plants as a biophysicist. What I have found is that the application of theoretical approach brings in an advance, I presume advance in the view of the overall viewpoint. The interesting question is, can this apply in all angles of natural biology? So. Does the theoretical approach necessarily represent an advance in the viewpoint that you obtain? Have I framed the question correctly? So, so who, who yeah. would like to respond to this? Uh, Sriram, would you care to say something about this? Does the theoretical view necessarily represent an advance? I mean, I. Uh... I don't know if it necessarily represents an advance, but uh, it's clear that the aim of science is uh, to take observations and build an overall picture from where you can, namely a theory, from where you can predict what will happen next in, area, in things that you haven't tried. So to, to that degree, uh, taking a theoretical approach does represent an advance. Uh, I hope I've understood the question correctly. But yeah, that's all I want to say, really, because um, uh, it's a sort of elementary truism that uh, experiment and theory depend on each other. And in that sense, uh, I don't think you can stop by merely making a set of observations and cataloging them and seeing if they fit in with uh, some general notion you have. You do need theory. So that's really all I had to say on that. Thank you. Uh, you know, you it's about this, or is it time is up? No, no, please go on briefly if you don't mind. Well, what I often uh, argue is that so we have this immense amount of experimental biology and experimental knowledge. And so nowadays we have, of course, also all these huge data sets about, um, uh, about genomes and, and, and their evolution. Um, so I think that, that what theoretical biology can, can do is, so just, uh, we have all that knowledge and we, d we have the knowledge, but have very often not the understanding uh, from what that, that knowledge means. So I don't think we necessarily have to uh, predict things. We, uh, uh, well, we, we do make models that, uh, um, predict things, but these things may be things that are already in the common knowledge of, of biology. Yeah, so that it can be prediction uh, in hindsight, as long as we don't use uh, that result in our modeling strategy. Yeah. Okay. That's... I, I, if that is a comment to what I said, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, then I didn't get that. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Pauline, and uh, thanks also, Francisca, Sriram, and Aprotim, plus all of you who have viewed this.